Hello, everyone. My name is Marina Isgro, and I am Associate Curator of Media and Performance Art at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Thank you so much for joining me and Donna Awartani in conversation today. Uh, car captioning and American Sign Language interpretation are being provided for this program, and we will place information about both of those options in the Zoom chat. Uh, today, Don and I will speak for about 35 minutes, and then we'll open to audience Q&A. So if you have a question, you can put it in the chat at any time in the, sorry, using the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, so now I'm honored to introduce Donna Awartani, a Palestinian Saudi artist whose work engages traditional and historical modes of making to address contemporary concerns. Donna has two works in the Hirshhorn's collection one of which is currently on view in our exhibition, Put It This Way, Revisions of the Hirshhorn Collection. The show curated by my colleague Anne Reeve focuses on the work of women and non-binary artists at the Hirshhorn. So born in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia in 1987, Donna received her undergraduate degree in fine art from Central St. Martin's London and a master's from the Prince's School London. There, she studied traditional techniques such as gilding, woodworking, ceramics, and more. She also trained with a master in illumination in Turkey. Donna's visually striking and conceptually rich work often incorporates geometric pattern and detailing, drawing from the history of abstraction in Islamic art. In recent years, her work has been included in exhibitions at the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art, the Institute of Arab and Islamic Art in New York, the Jewish Museum, and others. Her works are in the collections of the Sheikh Zayed National Museum in Abu Dhabi, the British Museum, the Guggenheim Museum, and more. So today I'm looking forward to learning more about Donna's work currently on view at the Hirshhorn and to chatting about some more recent projects. So welcome, Donna. You are joining us from Jeddah, where it is 8 p.m. So thank you for sharing your evening with us. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for the kind introduction. Absolutely. Um, so why don't we start this conversation talking about the work that's on view right now? We can pull up an image, please. Um, this work, the title is uh, I Went Away and Forgot You. A while ago, I remembered. I remembered I'd forgotten you. I was dreaming. And we will talk about that title later. Um, yes. But it's really, it's one of the highlights of, put it this way, of our show um, with this really beautiful, <laughs> intricate installation of sand, um, which is what you're seeing on the floor there, laid out in a geometric pattern in front of a video installation. And um, every time I walk through the show, the space is just completely full of visitors. So it's it's really been popular. Um, maybe we can actually go to the next slide as well to see a detail of what, what that sand really looks like. Um, so before we get to a video clip, Donna, I was wondering if you could give us some background on what inspired you to create this work. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, for me, this work is quite important to me. It's my really first performance piece as well. It's one of the first earlier works where I look at kind of um, cultural destruction within the contemporary um, world. So this this piece specifically looks at the architectural history of where I'm where I live and where I was born, which is Jeddah. And um, in in Jeddah, there's the old town which is called Al Balad and up to the late 50s, early 60s, most of the people still lived in these very traditional homes that were built um, out of stone and had these sort of wooden screens. And they were homes that didn't really need AC. You know, they were built for the environment. But in the late 50s and early 60s, with the introduction of concrete into Saudi, uh, what happened is a lot of the richer families started leaving their homes and abandoning these houses and building uh, newer homes that were actually inspired by um, European architecture, because at this time, it was a sort of golden age in Egypt, it was still colonized at that time. And there was this, this idea that in a way, Western culture was superior or better than um, your own culture. So the rich were trying to emulate the West. And so this, this performance was actually site specific to one of these homes that was built at that time, that you'll see in the upcoming video. Um, and I wanted to create something that was very visually um, Arab or Islamic that you would find in a lot of traditional homes and destroy that. So the way I also kind of 
created the work was using, um, it was inspired by sort of traditional techniques of how you make sand mandalas or in India as well, they do a lot of, um, um, they do kind of uh, floor installations with sand. Uh, so this is sand dyed with natural pigments. And um, yeah, another thing that's very important for me was, you know, I was thinking a lot of how I wanted to destroy it. You know, there was, I didn't want a, you know, a quick, violent way of destruction. I wanted something that was slow and methodical and purposeful, which I felt was a, a direct reflection of what was happening to these traditional homes, El Balad. You know, it was through consciously leaving them and this neglect has led to the dilapidation of these buildings. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much yeah. for that background. Let's take a minute and watch um, a clip of about, uh, I think it's about one minute long. And just to point out, this is sort of a an edited clip from the video. So we'll see a segment from the very beginning, some from the middle and then the very end. So let's play that clip. Beautiful. Um, so you you address this a little bit in your introduction, but could you walk us through the experience of making the sand portion of the installation first? How did that work, even in terms of yeah. developing these colored sands? So um, it was actually a very strenuous process because uh, I had to first buy sand, and there's no there wasn't any sort of sand that was perfect in terms of having no impurity. So I have to sift all the sand to remove any stones or rubble or anything in that. And I had to use a, the lightest sand I could find. And then I use uh, natural pigments. So these are the pigments I usually paint with. Um, they come directly from nature. There's no sort of chemicals and additive. And I mix it with the, the, the white sand and grind it with my hands. So it's to get all the colors. And then once that's done, I, I, I created these stencils. So I apply each color by layer um, and stencil that on. So it's a very laborious process. I mean, it takes uh, a couple of weeks and every time I sort of reproduce it to another space, it depends how big or small, it's, it's a long process. Yeah. And you know, it's something really you know interesting to point out about the work is when it came to the performative parts, it's not something I could have rehearsed. Or, or practice because that means I would have to redo the whole thing again. And mm. uh, we only did it with one take from one angle and, you know, hope <laughs> for the best. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Could you talk about the sort of emotional experience of that to spend so many hours creating this absolutely perfect and intricate piece and then having to yeah. destroy it? Yeah, for me, that was a sort of direct reflection of these, you know, historic buildings, because they are labors of love. They were built by craftsmen. You know, everything was handmade. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, when they see this work in person, they used to come up to me and be like, oh, why are you destroying it? Why don't you put a layer of plexi on top to cover it and preserve it? Or why don't you put some sort of adhesive? And, you know, it's funny to see that reaction to something that's, uh, you know, I, I created out of sand, but I'm like, you know, this is the exact feeling I feel towards seeing these buildings. And now these buildings are UNESCO World Heritage Sites over the last few years. Um, so yeah, it's a cautionary tale, really, this work. And yeah. yeah, another interesting thing to add, like, you know, what you mentioned before is the title of the piece. Right. So, because um, poetry really is, it plays an inspirational role in sort of all my pieces, all my works. And this this comes from um, a, a Palestinian poet called Mahmoud Darwish, who usually writes about longing and remembrance for Palestine and exile and how it feels to live outside of Palestine. So, you know, I thought it was quite fitting for the work that, you know, leaving, it's about leaving a place and being 
so like left it so long ago that it's no longer that conscious in your mind and it's just like mm-hmm. a dream. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one other thing that I wanted to talk about with this piece, if we can zoom out a little bit, is just to think about the medium, um, the way that you are incorporating performance art and video, mm-hmm. both of which are you know fairly recently developed artistic media. Um, with this more craft-based art, you know, working in painting with sand. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about that kind of mix of media in light of your own education. You know, you studied yeah. both at Central St. Martin's and at the Prince's School. So mm-hmm. talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think yeah, it's very important to bring up because that is the core ethics and eth- I mean ethos- ethos of my practice comes from my education and my experience. So, you know, when it first started off, I went to St. Martin's, which is, you know, a very contemporary art school. And it was brilliant in the sense of teaching me how to conceptualize a work, how to research, how to really think about what I want to say. Uh, but I felt that there was a huge lacking in how to make, you know, there, there wasn't an importance put on a medium or the outcome or the aesthetic of a work. It was much more about the thinking rather than the making. And as well at that time, you know, in in the school, in my specific class, there was just me and one other girl who were from the Middle East. Um, And I felt that they weren't really sure how, you know, there wasn't a lot of inclusivity in terms of the curriculum on Middle Eastern art. And the the only narrative at that time, I felt that people were aware of Middle Eastern artists was, you know, the themes of either being in exile um, and conflict and war or uh, suppression. Uh, as female suppression, you know, which are extremely important things. But I felt that, you know, is there, there's more to my identity as an Arab woman, um, because also I do come from Palestine, Syria, Jordan, and Saudi, you know, I'm quite mixed. And there's a richness to that, besides just those two things. So that's why I continued on, I went to the Prince's School, because at the Prince's School, it was much more focused on the Middle East in terms of traditional heritage. And It was the total opposite of St. Martin's. It wasn't about thinking, it was only about making. So I remember the first day when I went there, they told me, you're not coming in here as a contemporary artist, you're coming in as a craftswoman. And that's a whole different discipline of how you learn. Um, And it was great that I was exposed and learned a lot of amazing traditional, you know, like you said, there was gilding, there was parquetry, there was ceramics, there was natural pigments, making your own paint, uh, miniature painting, both Persian and Indian, even icon painting. So it was across other religions as well. Mm -hmm. But the the issue I felt with that is stuck in time because the way we learned is by copying and pasting. So you copy old objects to master that object. And and there was no sort of uh, innovation or continuity from that. So you just do the same thing. So what I really try to do is bridge both together because I do believe that traditional crafts is part of our collective heritage and identity. And with society being really sort of fast paced, capitalistic, very industrial, the the handmade and the, uh, you know, the craftsmen have slowly died out and everything's machine made. Mm -hmm. So I try to kind of incorporate um, in every single project I do some sort of work with craftsmen, artisanal craftsmen from different communities. And usually I work with crafts that I have experience in. So things that I know how to do or have done in the past. Right. Yeah. And we'll talk more about some of your collaborations with craftspeople later, Yeah. but I, I agree. I think what makes your work so exciting and so different is that sort of meeting of these two worlds of the, you know, conceptual contemporary art world and this history of, of craft and traditional art forms. Um, we have a question in the chat that I just want to read now. Um, Emily Weiss asks why you chose for this particular video to be silent because not all of your video work has been silent. Um, I mean, I didn't I didn't want any sort of focus on anything else besides the act of what I was doing. It was, you know, the repetitive motion of the sweeping. The only other sound that, you know, that could have been included is of the sand being swept. But I, I you know, once I tried that, I preferred it silent. I thought mm-hmm. it was much more powerful. Yeah, absolutely. OK, well, why don't we... Um move on then to another work in the Hirschhorn's collection. Mm -hmm. This is called um, Listen to My Words. And it's not currently on view, but we do have some video from it. Uh, It's an immersive installation involving silk panels that you see here and sound. So I think this time, why don't we watch a little video first and then we can dive into it. We will watch, um, I think, just about one minute of this clip. 
we can go ahead and play it. كتمت اسم الحبيب عن العباد ورددت الصبابت في فؤادي فوا شوقي إلى نادي خلي لعلي باسمي من أهوى أنادي أنا والله أصلح للمعالي وأمشي مشيتي وأتي هتيها وأمكن عاشق من صحن خدي وأعطي قبلتي من يشتهي لم يكن المجنون في حالة إلا وقد كنت كما كان لكنه باح بسر الهوى وأنني قد تبت كتمانا فما لبس العشاق من حلل الهوى ولا خلعوا إلا الثياب التي أبلي ولا شربوا كأسا من الحب مرة ولا حلوة إلا شرابهم فضلي جريت مع العشاق في حلبة الهوى ففقتهم سبقا وجئت على رسلي أما بعد أن أمسي وأصبح حرة وليس علي للرجال يدان أصير لزوج مثل مملوكة له لبئس إذا لم يكتب الملكان العيش بضر أو بضنك وحاجة مع العز خير من صروف لسان لو كنت تنصف في الهوى ما بيننا لم تهوى جاريتي ولم تتخيري Okay, great. Um, so Donna, could you start off by telling us a little bit about the sound component of this work? What is the what are the texts that we're hearing? And then whose mm -hmm. voices are we hearing them in? Yeah, so um, this actually, you know, as I mentioned before, a lot of my work kind of looks at poetry in within, you know, Arabic literature and also Sufi poetry. I really love and it really inspires me. But, you know, the whole time, most of the poems I came across, nearly all of them were just by men. You know, the famous poems like poets like Rumi and Hafiz and Ibn Arabi and Mahmoud Darwish. And I just thought that there wasn't a really strong um, tradition of female poets from the Middle East historically. But then I came across this one book. There was only just one book I could find that was an anthology of poems by Arab women from uh, quite old, I mean, 6th century up to the 12th century. And I was shocked by, by the content of these poems because they were so radical, not just for the time, but even for now. I mean, for a contemporary Middle East, um, I, you know, I couldn't imagine a, a woman living in the Middle East necessarily saying that those sort of poems. So I was really moved by them and I thought it was really important to kind of bring awareness to them. So uh, for this artwork, I selected um, certain poems from this book and re-recorded them with uh, women from Saudi Arabia. And these women are from the you know, uh, creative community. So there's um, two of them are artists, two are actresses um, who work in film. Um, there's a graphic designer as well. And they're all friends. So they're friends of mine. We re-recorded these poems together and this, when you enter the space, it's it's an immersive, you know, installation because the sound moves. It's you know above each one of these screens, there's a speaker. So the idea is you feel like you are in a sort of majlis, which is um, a sort of it's a, a traditional place where usually people congregate and speak and recite poetry historically. So that you feel that these women are in conversation with one another. Mm, um, and I, I mean, I, I have. One of the poems, just to give you an example for people oh, that's listening, great. Yeah. Yeah, who don't understand Arabic, you know, just to say uh, one of them is, um, I am a lioness and I'll never be a man's woman. If I had to choose a mate, why should I say yes to a dog when I'm deaf to lions? Right. So it's really, <laughs> um, and a lot that's of people incredible. Are, yeah, all, all the, the reaction of people were, were sh they were shocked. You know, the men were quite, um, uh disturbed they're kind of like pushed you know kind of were like what is this i'm listening to but a lot of the women <clears throat> were were moved by it you know some even cried listening to these poems um yeah yeah i wanted to ask you about that about this question of audience um because i know for a lot of artists working on sort of the global or international art scene there's this pressure to work in english um, so maybe mm -hmm. just talk a little bit about your your choice to use the original language one, and then who you kind of imagine as your audience when you're making this kind of work. 
Well, my origin is straight away. I thought, okay, my audience is the Middle East, is Saudi Arabia, because this piece was first shown in Saudi Arabia. And uh, even though I was really worried, you know, I was like, it's quite, you know, daring for that audience. But uh, I wanted the poems to be recited in the original context, because when you translate them into English, it doesn't sound as beautiful. Um, the rhythm of the poems is lost. It's the same with, uh, you know, Rumi. When you read Rumi in, in Persian, the original way, uh, it's very different to it in English. So I wanted to kind of uh, retain that beauty of the literature. Um, but also I did another piece that you can find on my website if you want to read all the poems in English. It's an animation, a digital animation with geometry with all of the same poems. So you can read the subtitles, their English translations of them. Great. Uh, we will put that in the chat. I'll track it down. I'll put it in the chat. Um, okay. So let's move now to the sort of visual component of the piece and talk mm -hmm. about these silk panels. Do you want to tell us about those? Yeah, so these were um, produced in collaboration with uh, craftsmen in India. And this, this sort of um, inspire, inspiration came from a story I read about um, this woman. She was married to an emperor in India, a Mughal emperor, and her name was Noor Jahan. And, uh, you know, it, it was said that this, this ruler, he wasn't that competent of a ruler. He didn't care about governing the country. He just cared about hunting, you know, uh, listening to poetry and just living a life of leisure. So what used to happen is she used to sit behind a lattice screen. In India, it's called Jali. Um, in Saudi, it's called the Mishrabiya. So this is this sort of Latin, lattice screen is you see a lot in Islamic architecture. So she used to sit behind one of these screens and whisper in his ear and tell him how to respond to the royal court on how to govern the country. So, you know, this this sort of uh, these stories about women being hidden is not just, you know, in India or the Middle East. I, I more I researched, the more I discovered actually it's across the whole world mm. where women's voices were silenced. So the screens here you see in the installation are are inspired by the 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 Jali or the Mishrabiya. So they are three layers of embroidery silk screens that are stretched. And there, you know, the geometry comes as well from a lot of the architecture that uses these screens. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it's it, it's. I wanted to also create that feeling of being able to see something but not, and hearing something but not knowing where it came from. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I think when we spoke earlier, you also spoke a little bit about the significance of these particular stitches that you were yeah. using. Do you want to talk about that too? Yeah, yeah. So this woman as well, Noor Jahan, the one I was referencing before, she also was a poet and she loved doing embroidery. And the specific stitch that she loved doing was called an Ari embroidery. So I wanted to use the same. So the stitching I use on this textile is Ari. It's a punch hole technique. Um, so that kind of, you know, references uh, her as well and pays homage to her lineage and I mean her history. Great. And someone in the chat is asking about the polygon shapes and whether they have different cultural meanings. So these, uh, no, these geometric mean, shapes, yeah. Well, these geometric shapes specifically I'm looking at within the Islamic art context. Of course, geometry is universal, but within Islamic architecture, you see these sort of the geometry heavily used. And the reason why is because the... A representation of an icon or a person was not really permitted in Islamic art. So this, this geometry flourished. And you can't, like, within the Islamic context, you cannot say that this specific pattern came from here or there because it's used everywhere. Like the six-pointed star that you see in the screen in the back, you find it in Mughal architecture, in Persian architecture, you find it even in Saudi or Hijazi architecture. So it's, it's universal to the region. Right. Thank you. Okay, let's um, shift gears a little bit and look at a work called Come Let Me Heal Your Wounds. It's actually a longer title. Come Let Me Heal Your Wounds, Let Me Mend Your Broken Bones as We Stand Here Mourning uh, from 2019. So we have just been talking about textiles. This work also incorporates textiles, though in a different way. Uh, and there is a lot to dive in with this piece uh, regarding technique. So maybe first just give us a little introduction to, to the concept behind this. Yes. So here uh, is where I kind of really began heavily researching cultural destruction across the Middle East. And I was specifically looking at the Arab Spring. So with the rise of ISIS, um, you know, invading and taking over Syria and Iraq, what they did is they purposefully destroyed 
a lot of different heritage sites and and you know n- you know those churches um shrines citadels uh, pre-islamic um places like palmyra um and even mosques themselves you know this crazy fundamental thinking of of cultural cleansing so what i did is I started creating an archive where I'm trying to find all the different locations that these monuments have been destroyed and um, created a map uh, of all of them. And after I had this map, I uh, translated the pinpoints from the map onto the textile and then teared the dots where there was the, the points of destruction and then repaired it using darning. So here, for example, is just uh, Iraq for just one country. Um, and I, I ended up archiving around 350 different monuments. And all those red pinpoints are monuments that have either been completely gone or just, you know, destroyed or partly destroyed. Um, so it is a, a, a map of destruction of the Middle East, but since the Arab Spring onwards. Mm. How closely were you sort of mapping these points onto fabric? Were you literally overlaying, you know, to to map them or is it more sort of metaphorical or how did that work? So in terms of each country, yes, it yeah. was kind of literal, but when it came to the the kind of composition of the artwork, they I slightly moved some of the panels around to com- put them together better because the countries I looked at were, you know, there was Syria, there was Iraq, there was Egypt, there was Libya, Tunisia, and even Yemen, um, mm-hmm. you know, and there, there's, you know, it's the, the actual artwork does reference the original maps uh, but it's slightly changed. Right, like the big sense. yellow one here at the front is Yemen. The two at the okay. back are Iraq. Wow. Let's go to some of those detail shots as well so we can see them up close. Um, and I wonder if you could talk more about this this process of, of darning and this idea of mm-hmm. physical repair and how that serves as a metaphor here. Yeah, I mean, I... Um, First of all, you know, darning, when the more I learned about it, I realized that, you know, it's a dying art. Uh, my generation don't really know how to mend. This is something my grandmother used to do. And, you know, or you know, most uh, older, elder people, when they see the work, they resonate with it. They're like, yes, we used to do this. We used to fix our clothes. You know, the relationship they used to have with textiles or any object was if it's, you know, if there's something broken, you mend it. You don't throw it away. And, you know, the society we live in now is so um, disposable. You know, you have something that's uh, destroyed, throw away, go to Zara, you can buy it for like $5. It's, and it's wasteful and it's, um, it's not very sustainable. It's not friendly to the environment. So I found there was such beauty to that act of repair. And I wanted to use that specific medium in this work because for me, it was the, the, the act of destroying and repairing was a bit like... Um, Cathartic. It was a way of me healing and dealing with seeing this, the, the mass scale of destruction of where I come from. Yeah, I and, love the way you yeah. bring together that sort of like question of material or environmental sustainability with this idea of sustaining cultural heritage. It's just such a rich meeting of two, two concepts. Um, mm-hmm. I It strikes me as we're talking that um, this is also kind of a gendered form of, of labor or craft, darning as is sweeping. Um, and I know you're looking at craft in general, which is practiced by both men and women. Um, but could you talk a little bit about the, the gendered part of this? Are you referencing yeah, women's I'm, labor? Yeah. No, actually, because all the craftsmen I've worked with on textiles have been men, um, huh. at least, you know, in the Middle East and well, not in the Middle East, specifically more in India, where I produce these works in collaboration with them, they're all men. Um, so, but there is, you know, it, it's, other audiences do see it as gender. They do see that like <laughs> sweeping, uh, even me wearing the abaya as, as, as a, a statement. But, you know, um, it wasn't when I wasn't thinking about it at that time. I had to wear the abaya because it was an artwork being produced to be shown in Saudi. And at that time, Saudi wasn't that open, at the, you know, more liberal. So there were much more practical choices. Um, yeah. I hope so that answers your, your question. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That shows my um, bias and how I view these things. Um, maybe we could talk about the the colors that you're using here, which yeah. are just so vivid and beautiful. And I know there's a whole process behind the creation yeah. of those colors. So let's talk about that. I think we have some images as well. Yeah, so the, this is also another very 
important uh, aspect to the work was um, how I dyed the textiles. So what I did is I collaborated with craftsmen in a place called Trivandrum in South India, which is really the birthplace of Ayurvedic medicine, or it's at least a very strong hub of Ayurvedic medicine. And um, using tradition principles from trad traditional medicine, we use the same herbs, spices, um, bark, and things that they find from the local forest to create these textiles. So in essence, they are healing textiles. They're not just natural dyes, they also have medicinal properties. Um, you know, and this idea of traditional medicine is also present in the Middle East. There, you know, it, it's come through from India and we have the same traditions that is also dying out. You know, when I was working with these craftsmen, they say that the, you know, people in the local community are, they don't care too much about necessarily working with traditional dyes or buying traditional text, traditional dyed textiles, they would prefer to just prefer to just buy cheaper um, chemically dyed uh, textiles, which is a shame because you know one of the leading pollutants of rivers um, and water is chemicals from these from these textiles. So what's the beauty of this workshop um, is all the leftover dyes that we use become biofuel. So they're thrown back into the forest. They're non-harming. Uh, so it's a completely eco-friendly process of, of producing an artwork. And yeah, this is an example of uh, some, this is for the turmeric and different, like there's 250 different spices and herbs and, oh. and things in it. And then there's one more photo, I think, of a red dye. Yeah, yeah. So we there have we to boil it for a while and then let them, you know, take them out to dry in a dark place so the color doesn't fade. So it was a really beautiful process to, to work in, actually. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, let's talk. I, I'm conscious of our time and there's some great questions mm -hmm. coming in, but I want to touch on a couple more works first. Um, so there's a work that you made in 2021 called Standing by the Ruins of Aleppo that I think is really important that we talk about. Um, and as in the, the work at the Hirshhorn, this has a basis on the floor. Um, mm -hmm. Could you introduce this work for us? I especially liked mm -hmm. when we first spoke about it, you talked about it from both a broader cultural perspective and then also a very personal kind of family perspective. Yeah, so um, this work, uh, continuing from my research of cultural cleansing, this is specifically looking at a mosque in Aleppo, um, the, the Great Mosque of Aleppo, which was heavily damaged during the Arab Spring. And what I did for this piece is I, this is a recreation of the actual courtyard from that mosque. So there was no floor plans I could find online or, you know, image of the whole thing. So it took me actually a while just collating images you know, there's some I could find of just the corners or certain sections. So putting it, puzzling it together and recreating the actual drawing of the floor, of the courtyard. And here, instead of producing it in the original context, which was stone, I produced it uh, using um, clay earth, which is inspired by a dull building. So the, because this was shown just to, sorry, <laughs> jumping between, just to say this was first shown in Riyadh. And the old town of Riyadh was, um, was built by mud houses, so using clay earth to create homes. So I wanted to use that technique, but instead of the traditional technique where they add hay when making clay bricks so it doesn't crack and it solidifies, I purposefully left out the, the hay. So you have bricks that are sun-baked and then they naturally crack on their own. So I recreated it and there was around um, 13,000 different bricks and all the clay was sourced locally from different parts of Saudi. And I had like a great team of craftsmen that work on restoring traditional homes in Riyadh, the, the heritage sites in Riyadh. Yeah, these are close-ups. Yeah, that you can really and, see that cracking that you were talking about. Yeah, and also this title, again, I wanna add, Standing by the Ruins. In Arabic, um, where it was taken from, it's, it's called Waqfu al-Atlal. And it's a very important trope in Arabic poetry that it's called ruin poetry. So anyone who is aware of uh, Arabic literature or is a poet would know this genre. And it's it looks at poetry about destruction, about uh, ruins, and it's very old as well. This is also pre-Islamic form poetry that a lot of contemporary poets have referenced and used throughout. And um, yeah, lastly, to touch upon the personal side that you're mentioning, you know, for me, um, I know at least in the Middle East, a lot of people kind of give more value to the identity of your father as opposed to your mother. Like you take on 
your father's second name. You take on your father's religion, nationality. And I felt that, you know, the women were not as um, valued as much. But for me, at least in my family, the the I wanted to pay homage to the matrilineal lineage because my grandmother, who is from Syria, is the one who really has shaped all of us. You know, um, we we eat Syrian food at home. We speak Syrian. Um, and her influence is really what shaped our family more than the men. So it was an homage to, to her as well and the women in my family. And also, you know, she's really old right now and she's losing her memory. You know, she has dementia. So it's the sadness as well of forgetting where she is, where she comes from. And, you know, I felt that as a reflection as well of a lot of people who have to forcibly leave their homes and where they come from and not be able to go back, that home becomes a distant memory that you forget. Absolutely. It's such a rich work. Um, I also realized that we have the dimensions in centimeters, uh, but for those of us who aren't used to thinking in centimeters, this is 74 feet long. So this is extremely large. Um, I want to pause here and talk a little bit more about your work with craftspeople, which I think is very, very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you could talk about like how you find your collaborators um, and what that collaboration process looks like on the ground. So, I mean, it varies from each project. So sometimes, most of the time, it's if I'm invited to participate in a biennial um, and, you know, they ask whether I'm interested in working with a certain local community and they'll help kind of find the right people I want to work with. Uh, a lot of times I can do it myself as well, like a recent project I'm working on. I'm working with stonemasons from Syria where I read about a training program that they did and I ended up going there and meeting them in person. So it's it takes a lot of time and labor to find the right people to work with. Um, and, you know, I, I also want to add that a lot of the times there's some craftsmen who don't want to deviate from what they know how to do. So they will just do what they've been doing for, you know, if that's been passed down. Uh, and they won't want to experiment or innovate with that, which I respect and understand. So it's about finding the right people to work with. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the process of collaborating is actually very interesting because it also pays homage to, to the tradition of the craft. So historically, within different crafts, if we look at, for example, just manuscript illumination, which I'm trained in, there was a master illuminator who would be the one who would compose the design. And then there'd be someone else, for example, who's just in charge of the gilding. He would do the gold. Right. And then there'd be someone else who would be in charge of putting the base colors and someone else for outlining. So sometimes in certain crafts, it's a collective uh, way of production. Um, same with, if you look at Zilij work in Morocco, um, there's somebody who's just in charge of making the, the clay tiles and someone else in charge of cutting, someone else in charge of glazing, so on and so forth. So um, in this instance, you know, I can kind of come in as the, the lead craftswoman because I also want to add that I don't work in crafts that I have not worked in myself. So I generally know what I've worked, you know, how to, to change things, how to solve things, because, you know, there's a lot of things that problems you'll face that need to be fixed. So in this instance, I'm kind of like, I'll work with them to create the design and do this and that. And then we do tests together, sampling of things and yeah. Okay. Um, let's take a look at one last work before we get to our audience questions. This is a very recent work from last year and it's called Where the Dwellers Lay. Uh, yes. Talk a little bit about this before we jump into Q&A. Yeah, so this work um, was a site-specific piece I was invited to do in al Hula, Saudi Arabia. It was my first outdoor work as well. And um, when I went for a site visit for the first time, it was extremely daunting because al Hula is incredibly beautiful. It was not like the usual experience of working in a gallery space or a white cube where you have no backdrop and you can do what you want. Here, I was working with something that was just so overwhelmingly stunning that I felt I wanted to create an artwork that paid homage to the landscape, that I felt that it belonged there rather than competed with the background, something that complements it. Um, so, and also, you know, another challenge I had is if you see most of my work are quite delicate, they're quite formal, you're not, you can't touch it. It's not something you can engage with more than just looking at it. But here I wanted to create an artwork that draws people in, that people can, it's a bit of a pavilion as well. You know, you can sit inside this piece. And it's inspired by the tombs of Al-Ala. So the old tombs, they used to have this staircase stepwell design on, on carved on the facade. And it's a symbol of the staircase to heaven. 
Um, so using that simple geometry, I created this pattern, this, this sculpture from it. And it was made with uh, sandstone as well, you know, so that plays a functional role that, you know, in the desert, the, the stone absorbs the heat and then cools the inside. So when you're inside, it's actually much cooler than it is outside. Right. And this is, is this the first interactive work that you've made? Maybe you could talk about how, how visitors have been engaging with it. If anything surprised you about that? Yeah, it was very surprising because, you know, the placement of the work was very important. When I tried to find the location, you can see in this picture, it's kind of elevated on a slight hill. And when you're sitting inside the artwork and looking outwards, it has a beautiful view of the whole valley. So it was, I wanted to have it as a place of contemplation where you can really enjoy your surroundings, but actually nobody did that. Everyone was taking selfies inside, which was really disappointing. <laughs> so everyone was looking inwards rather than outwards. I mean, I get it. It is stunning. <laughs> um, all right. So we've got four questions here that I think are great. Um, okay. Let's just take them in order. So Hamza Khan asks, have you done direct collaborations with Iranian, South or Central Asian artists, or do you have any future plans to? Uh, with Iranian, no, I haven't. Actually, no, I, I worked with an Iranian architect to develop a Mkarna design. Um, and but it wasn't art designs directly. It was more of kind of developing a design. But I've been to Iran for when I was in university for a study trip, and it was incredibly beautiful. I mean, the architecture there is incredible. So I, I hope so. I hope that will be something I'd work with next. I want cool. to do next. Yeah. Um, Nancy Bannon asks, how long is the process for you typically from idea through completion? Is it several years? Um, I mean, I wish I had several years, <laughs> uh, but no, it's a really <laughs> long process. And, and, you know, the, the great thing about, you know, there's a lot of positives about working with craftsmen and working with your hands. Uh, and because, you know, the works end up being unique pieces. I don't really create additions. I don't mass produce, but the downside is that it's such a slow process that, you know, I don't have a lot of work to produce. So, you know, last year I created just the two works, the Standing by the Rooms of Aleppo and uh, the one you saw in Al Ula because it takes such a long time. Like the Standing by the Ruins altogether was nearly one year of research from the research to the visualization, to production, to install. Um, and also obviously it depends on the project and all of that, but typically it takes at least a couple of months. Okay, great. Um, okay, this is a great question. Hi, do you find repetition an essential part of your work? Is this the performance element to your work? I find the repetition soothing, but also a sort of reflection of the machine-like performance of humans in a capitalist society where we repeat actions over and over. So what are the different valences of repetition in your work? Well, this concept of repetition is extremely important within Islamic art. So if you look at it traditionally, um, it's seen as a form of dhikr and dhikr is translated as remembrance. So it's the remembrance of the divine. So it is the, when you do a traditional craft, it's laborious, it's repetitive. You're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And it's a, that discipline that is supposed to sort of kind of put you in a meditative state. So it's seen a lot of the times on the craft is seen as something as a spiritual practice within the Islamic context. So for me as well, you know, because when I'm painting or I'm doing geometry, it is a laborious, repetitive process. And I find solace in that. It actually calms me and I get agitated when I'm not doing it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a nice disconnect from the reality of the world. And you're just focusing on this one thing that requires all your attention and do it again and again and again. Right. So I see it as a positive rather than a reflection of, you know, the capitalistic side. It's not, you know, because another thing to, to say, you know, the machine is making without thinking, right? But when it comes to craft, they do not duplicate the same thing over and over again. They're, I mean, in terms of like, if you're working on a, a wooden door, it's a unique design that takes a long time, but you wouldn't replicate that door. It's something new. You do something else differently again. Yeah, that's an important distinction to make. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, this is a question for both of us, although I don't know how much I can contribute here. Um, is there a way to pass on Donna's knowledge and practice of eco-friendly dyes and paints to the wider community of artists, especially Western artists? Have you ever considered like doing a workshop or, or another way to kind of disseminate that knowledge, Donna? 
Um, I mean, you know, the more I look into it, there's actually a lot of people globally that work with natural dyes. So it's not you can it's not just from India or you know a certain context. There's a lot of contemporary textile art, artists that I've seen uh, on Instagram or online that work with it. And there's a lot of uh, online resources, by the way. You know, if you go online. You can find guidebooks. You can even buy books on how to create natural dyes. And you can create dyes at home easily, um, you know, from onion peels, pomegranate, things like that. Um, so it's, you know, it's very easy to learn. Um, I personally haven't done any workshops on natural dyes, but I, I, there's a lot of resources out there. Cool. Thank you. Um, Sunny Kim says, thanks for such a stimulating discussion. Donna, what has been the most challenging collaboration? And would you share why? Oh, the challenging. Um, I think they all have their own challenges. Um, maybe the most challenging in terms of the intensity was standing by the rooms just merely due to the sheer skill and the intensity of production. You know, we that process was, you know, I'm baking bricks in the sun. So we were dependent on the sun and we would only work from sunrise to sunset. So I'd have to be up by 5 a.m. and we'd all be on site. Um, to kind of get as much done as possible. Um, and I think that was quite intensive for us. You know, it, it was beautiful also because, you know, I was just exhausted and asleep by eight o'clock. Um, and yeah, I think, and also uh, it was just finding the right clay earth because this is not something you could just buy in a shop. You have to actually go and find it in the landscape. And you usually find them either in dried up riverbeds that have the minerals properties or, in farms where they they irrigate the land a lot. So um, finding and testing the material took a long time to producing it that took a long time. And the, the labor of it, you know, of just making thousands and thousands of bricks was difficult. Wow, I can imagine. I wonder how, how did the craftspeople respond to your request to like leave out the hay and allow the bricks to crack? <laughs> Most of the craftspeople I work with think I'm crazy until they see the end results, right? <laughs> so they're just like, what are you doing? You know, this is not traditional, it's not normal, but there's always the sense of pride, right? So the craftsmen are with me through this process. They come to the openings, you know, they, you know, when I worked in Morocco, the craftsmen came with their whole family. And it's it's also, I feel, you know, they get interested to see that their skill set can be applied in different ways. And, you know, also to elevate it. Because, you know, unfortunately, what's happened with craft is it's craft is, is a bad word in contemporary art. Um, it's seen as something that's purely decorative. And because there's not a lot of support for craft communities, either the, line, the, the tradition has died out completely, where the next generation don't want to continue that on and rather, you know, end up working in other jobs that pay more money. Um, or, you know, the value of it as well, the patronage before work. We used to have, you know, the, the kings and rulers at the time supporting these craftsmen. Now that they, the only thing they can do is make cheaper version of those objects to sell in a souk for tourists. Yeah. So it, it's nice to kind of bring back the, you know, the value of it. Oh, absolutely. Okay, we have one last question. We're over time, but I'm going to ask it if that's okay. Um, okay. This is another question about natural dyes. And this person asks, have you found any difficulty sourcing traditional ingredients as the practice of using them has diminished or as the ecosystem is changing? Well, so what is it like I produce, to yeah, I had to go there. It's not something I can go find these materials and do it in the studio. I, may, I had to go to Trivandrum to work with them directly because they sourced it from the local forests. So um, they they didn't have any issues with that because you know nothing was imported everything was locally sourced and you know the there's still a, you know rich forest there in in, in uh, Trivandrum. Great, thank you, um, thank you, Donna, for joining me tonight. This was so much fun. This was great, and my pleasure. Uh, we've received a lot of great comments in the Q and A as well. Um, thank you to Julie and Candace for their assistance with interpretation and captioning and to Amy who managed our slides. Um, and finally, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Um, if you're interested in more artist talks, you can join again on February 15th when we'll be talking with Tony Lewis and curator Betsy Johnson on art and poetry. And if you have not seen Donna's work at the Hirshhorn, I strongly encourage you um, to go see because it's just so beautiful in person. It's hard to convey through a slide. So thanks again, Donna. Thank you so much. All right. Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.